chapter 13, the final verse there, verse 33, and then skip over and read a few in, in chapter 14. In chapter 14, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, 22 and 23. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, said unto the leaders, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. You all see the exclamation point, right? They didn't just suggest it. Okay. Or would God... We had died in this wilderness, 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these 10 times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. The word of the Lord for the people of God, you can take your seat. God's pretty serious about his word, you see. And the thing is, when he shows you stuff, you can't go around them forgetting what he showed you. Well, tonight we want to begin a new series entitled, I Saw, I Saw. And we want to speak from the sermon topic tonight, who is catching your eye? Who is catching your eye? Whoever captures your eye will soon enough capture your attention and very possible uh, then capture your heart. Be careful of who catches your eye. You see, what I have certainly learned is that I do not spend a whole pile of seconds trying to convince the blind to see what I see or trying to transform the sight belief of one who is firm and fixed in their ways. I believe that there are seasons in the lives of people when their eyes are apt to be open to the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Until then, they will see what they see no matter what I tell them I see. The Bible is clear that mankind, since the beginning of times, has been challenged concerning what they see. God himself can tell mankind something, and as long as mankind slip into flesh, the flesh realm, even God's word will carry little weight. A church, here's what I want you to know, that it is an eyesore. For you to make a conclusion that is not God's conclusion because of what you see. Yeah. See, I, 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 <laughs> I've never said this, but this is interesting. I walk in denial all the time. I walk in denial. <laughs> like, oh, oh, pastor. Oh, 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 pastor. Don't say that. Don't go and get, get out there. I, I walk in denial all the time. I deny what men see. I deny what the sinner sees. I deny even what I see 
if what I see is not what God said I should see. Yeah, yeah. It is an eyesore again for you to conclude what God has not concluded. You just missed it. I've decided that mankind's conclusion is an optical illusion and is not in fusion with God, but rather in collusion with the godless. And this is what we will see as we look at our text. In doing so, I will cover the following three points. Point one, how I see. How I see. Point two, how they see. Hmm, how they see. And point three, who will see? Who will see? Point number one, how I see. How I see. These are my glasses. How I see. Come here, Janice. <laughs> Come here, Deidre. <laughs> These are my glasses. How I see. Put them on. Get a little sharp. That's my winter pair. Black, black, black. These are my summer pair. Dark brown and white. <laughs> mm. How I see. <laughs> you have to be so obvious. <laughs> How I see. <laughs> watch this. Watch this. You can't see a thing. <laughs> That's why your pastor sees special. See that? <laughs> Talking about how I see. These glasses may fit your face, but the prescription doesn't fit your sight. I'm very careful that I don't allow other people's prescription of what they see to become uh, the interpretation of how I should see. Uh, the situation may fit you, but it's not for you. The, the situation may fit you, but it's not for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, glorifying God, aren't you? <laughs> you go back to your doctor tomorrow, you may have to really change your prescription to keep these on. But, but here is the thing, that when they looked in the land and they saw giants, they saw something that God said was not there. They, they saw something, and because their heart was off, their heart was wrong, what they saw was not what God had prescribed. They saw giants. God said, that's your land. But when you see a giant, then it can determine whether you'll go in and possess what God says for you. And this is what I want you to understand. What God says for you, it is for you. What instruction God gives, if he shows you something, huh? if he shows you something, it doesn't matter what your best girlfriend says, it doesn't matter what your ace boom coom says, what has God caused you to see? And based on that, that's your prescription. And you keep your eyes focused. Because if you put my glasses on, your eyes are going to go out of focus. If you put my glasses on, things are not going to be easy. When you try to read the situation, you're going to come up with the wrong sentence. And I just believe it's time for God's people to stop sentencing themselves to death. God's people, time to stop being sentenced by the enemy's vision. You can take your seat. Thank you. My glasses back. <laughs> That's right, y'all got your own glasses. And look at you smiling. You can see. So when, when you wear your own glasses, you can see. And when you see how God meant for you to see, then it will bring contentment to yourself. Because all of a sudden, you've got 2020. When you put on my glasses, trust me, you don't have 2020. <laughs> You'll be lucky if you go one on one. <laughs> My glasses. So church, I am careful not to let others persuade me into seeing as they do. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to see as I see. 
My chief aim, goal, and purpose is to see as God sees. And one thing I like about God is that with one sentence, with one picture, he can have all of us see at the same time a perfect vision of what he has for us. In the text, God has seen his people suffering in bondage under the hand of Pharaoh, and God had seen to it that a deliverer called Moses went in and had released them from the shackles of Egyptian slavery. Now, as far as I read, no one had an issue with being set free. I know what your Bible says. I know what my prince says. And it sounded to me like they all got the little unleavened bread and suitcase and said, we're out of here. I didn't see anybody saying, no, I want to stay. I want to stay. I like the onions. Nobody was saying it at that time. Yet I have learned that, watch this, it is once a people are free that the real challenge begins and the real you shows up. <laughs> uh oh, yes. While all are in chains, all sing, Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Everybody in chains sings Kumbaya. However, when all are free and can speak and do as they like, this is when you will discover if there was really any unity in the first place. It was while in the wilderness and on, hear this, on the brink of crossing over that the devil captures the eye sight and made their eyes sore. You need to get that, people, that every time you are about to cross over into the next place that God has for you, that's when the devil shows up as never before because he has to make you see something. He has to distort your vision so that your eyes become sore and that what you see is an eye sore. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. What they saw were giants, and they were intimidated by giants. Uh, amazing. Hmm. God had pretty recently delivered them from one of the greatest giants ever, slavery under the hand of an unjust capitalist system, and it is as if they had forgotten what God did. Unbelief and lack of faith sight will do it every time. They will do it every time. God, God is about taking them from one place to another. <laughs> God wants to get you out and take you in. But you see giants, you see excuses. You see reasons why you can't be free yet. A God is ready for you to go into the promise and provision. A you are not too, too sure God knows what he is saying or doing. God said the land is yours. You look and see current inhabitants and you say uh, the land is theirs. And I want to encourage somebody. Don't confess the opposite of what God has shown you. When God says something, stick to it. Uh, st have a spirit of stick to itness. that no matter what I currently see, if God said my child is saved, I see them saved. If God says my child is delivered, I see them delivered. Oh, I may not know how. I, I may not know when, but God will do it again. Why? Because I know that I was in a state a sin sick state and God reached down his hand for me and the hand of God is still not short and he will still reach down and pick up your son pick up your daughter pick up your niece pick up your nephew pick up your grandchild pick up your grandchild pick up your cousin pick up your best friend pick God will pick him up God will do it every time God said the land is yours when you speak against God's word, you are committing spiritual 
suicide. So I thought about this. God says, Maria, in the kingdom, you have those people who I would term spiritual suicide bombs. In other words, they're willing to sacrifice their own self, take their self out of the picture, and take out whoever's around me will just receive damage. But I've come to serve notice on the enemy that we will not be spiritual suicide bombers. We will not speak against what God told us. If God said yes, I will not speak no. If God says he will, I will not say he won't. If God God said, hold on, I will not give up. If God says it shall be, I will not say I cannot see how it shall be. I don't care what is going on. I said, God already said that it shall be. Don't go around being a spiritual suicide. I don't care if the enemy does something negative. Listen, it may happen, but God already has a concluding plan. Don't give up on the brink of your miracle. Don't give up in the midst of the process. Don't give up when it seems life is too hard. Don't give up when your heart is broken. Don't give up when it's full of pain. You've got to hold on. Don't kill yourself. Don't deny. You've got to get over to Canaan. Don't die in the wilderness. Understand this. The enemy didn't take you out in Egypt. Don't let him take you out in the wilderness. And for God's sake, don't let the enemy have you take your own self out. You got to understand. You got to understand it. And so church, what I know is <laughs> that before, somebody say before. before. Before I am about to go into my next place of prosperity, listen, the devil will always manifest himself as some sort of giant. Oh yeah, some, some, some sort of giant to frighten you. Whatever, Lord, I hear that Holy Ghost. Whatever your worst nightmare is, that's the giant that will show up. The very thing that you said, God, I can take this, God, I can take, but don't let that happen. When you are about to get into your next place of prosperity, the enemy forms. A situation that looks just like what you said, God, I, if that happens, I couldn't take it. You open up your mouth, you said it, you thought it. And the enemy, when you're about to go into your next place, he presents the very thing, the very boogeyman, the very experience, the very situation that you said, I, I can't handle if that happens. Hold on, dude, hold on. <sighs> and so, uh, look, I see it like this. As soon as, watch it now, as soon as I see a giant in my land, notice I'm already said it's my land. As soon as I see a giant in my land, I already know I'm going in, boys. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> the presence, hear me, Holy Ghost, the presence of the giant is verification and validation that the land is yours. No giant, not yours. No giant, no land. Because the enemy would not let you go in and possess something that easy. So the moment that you see a giant, you ought to start celebrating. I got the land, I got the land. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And then go and face your giant square on. And let your giant know you're coming down. If you see the giant, the land is yours. Lord have mercy. You see, <laughs> it is not the giant that will kill you. No, it is your own words. Your own suicidal words that will kill your future. You just have to kill what God has spoken and you're through. Listen, as powerful as God is, and he is all-powerful, omnipotent, if you do not believe, it won't happen. Uh-huh. Uh 
You just stopped the plan of God for your life. God is truth, but the issue is not God. The issue will always be, number two, how do they see? <laughs> they were minutes away, minutes, you hear me? Minutes away from the border of Canaan. Minutes! The enemy, if Canaan was months away, the enemy is not going to be as intense to stop you. But when you see it, he says, okay, we've got we to gotta pick up the attack. We can't, we can't have them to make it in. Huh? So when you're minutes away from Canaan, the enemy will show up as never before. These people, they were minutes away from Canaan, but because of what they saw with their own eyes, they were about to use a round trip ticket. A return ticket. There are some places that you ought not return to. I know most times when I leave Bermuda, I am delighted to return back to the blue waters of Bermuda. But there are some places, Egypt, that when you are delivered from Egypt, it has to be a one-way ticket. Do not let the... Don't go on quicker ticks. World travel. There you see travel. Don't go on Expedia.com. And say, I'm booking a ticket. I'm from Egypt, wrong trip. From Egypt to, well, in the vicinity of Canaan. And then I'm coming back to Egypt. No, 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 no. First thing you do is say, one way. In other words, I'm leaving Egypt. I'm leaving the place of bondage here in Jerome. I'm leaving the place that used to have me bound. I'm leaving those places where I used to use things that had me bound. I'm leaving an attitude of Egypt, and it's a one-way ticket because I'm not going back. I'm not turning back. God has done too much for me, and I'm going into my promised land. I can't go back. I won't go back to the way things used to be. I'm going in, boys. A one way. No return ticket. Church, I am seriously appalled. Why? Because there are people today just like the wandering Israelites. You think they have made Jesus their choice when really they brought a wrong trip ticket to return back to their old ways, return back to Egypt just in case the things don't work out with God. <laughs> oh, no, not me. One-way ticket out of Egypt, out of sin, and I will not be returning back. No, 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 to the place I escaped. Hear me. Hold on. I escaped. It means there was something going on there that I was petrified of, uh, that, that I, it, it disgusted me, and I had been praying for a long time to get out. Yeah. So ha, if I spent a whole lot of time saying, God, deliver me out of this place. God, I, I need to move. God, is there a place of freedom? God, there's got to be a, a place better than this. God, if you take me out of this place, I promise I'll never go back. When God delivers you, when he sets you free for real from the place of bondage, you can't go back. You don't want to. You escaped. No. You ever seen those TV programs, the prison escape shows? You ain't never seen nobody escape the prison and talk about I'm going to escape back in. I, I just have never seen it. They climb the wall, they go under, they go through the electrical dean, they go at night, they're running from the dog, to all of this stuff. I never seen anybody free on the road and say, I want to escape back. <laughs> you, you, you don't see that. 
And if a sinner, if a prisoner has enough sense to know that when you escape the prison, don't go back, dummy. They got your scent. Lord, I hear you, Holy Ghost. They got the smell of you. The dogs are after you to take you out. If you go near that prison, if you go near that vicinity, they're going to sniff you out. And when they sniff you out, they're not going to have mercy on you. They're not going to just tash you. They might shoot you dead. They'll rip your skins. The dogs will come after you. So when you escape, you got to stay out. Going back. Going back. <laughs> I told you already, Janice and Maria would have been with Harriet Tubman. You'd be reading about us in history. I don't know how it would have ended, but you would have read about it. Oh, yeah. We would have escaped. Try a whole coup. Coup d'etat. Oh, yeah, we will be on America's Most Wanted, whatever, all that. But I tell you here, I tell you the truth, I'm not staying anybody's prisoner. I'm not staying in bondage and shackled and limited. I can't, can't handle that. Verses 1 and 2 again of chapter 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. Sounds like you feel, should feel sorry for women. Don't cry in. God, I'll keep on reading. And the people wept that night. You, I, I can't pay attention to every cr crying Christian. But Pat, they're crying and weeping. So are these people. It sounds so sincere. Verse 2. And all the children, not, not, not the weeping and the crying people. All the children of Israel, what? Murmured against Moses and against Aaron. They're crying. <laughs> oh, God, you know, that got to be the wrong leaders. Jesus. Well, no, not Jesus. He hadn't come yet. God. <laughs> Yahweh. <gasps> Lord God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mercy, thank you. I know why. It's the wrong one. That's for that Aaron. <laughs> Oh, the leader's got an assistant in Aaron. Father, help us. <laughs> Woo. We haven't gotten into the promised land yet. I know they can't be a leader. Your hand has left them. The glory has departed. Moses and Aaron have got to be Ichabod. God, deliver us. Weeping and crying. A mess. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation, you know, say, so got unity. <laughs> you got unity. I mean, it sounds so of God, doesn't it? And said unto them, talking to the leaders, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Hmm, I wish we had a fat axe. I would have shipped them right back. Right here, douche. Good. Oh, would God we had died in the wilderness, in this wilderness. I mean, you talk about suicidal words. And see, here, here's the thing. When you have suicidal words, you're not only trying to take out yourself, but your seed with you. When you begin, watch this, to see things like negative people, you will experience depression, denial, division, and then death. God sees Canaan. You see, can't do this. God sees new opportunity. You see, it will never work out. Whatever the devil designs is antichrist and anti God. Whatever the devil designs to turn you against the leader who is designed to take you into Canaan is not of God. Verse 4. And they said, <laughs> They might have, must have had an AGM with Auntie Pastor. And <laughs> they, they, they said to one another, let us make a captain. <laughs> Where did captain go and take us? Where did captain? And let us return into Egypt. You've got to be kidding. Let us make a captain that's going to take us back to Egypt. They are going to replace Moses and head back to Egypt when Canaan's right in front of them. 
Now, church, God showed me something here. And, you know, everything to me is amazing. God's word. But this is amazing. Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children. <laughs> this is the reason Moses and Aaron were not going to be leaders in the new place. Let me read it again, because now that you said, my pastor, so let me read it again. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. The congregation who lost their mind. The congregation who wants to vote them out. The congregation who wants to replace them. So the pastor is bowing down to a bunch of nutcases. This is the reason why Moses and Aaron were not going to be leaders in the new place. Can you imagine if Moses and Aaron, who are giving in to the whims of the people, oh, you all, I made you cry and weep. I'm sorry. I forgive me. Let's go on. We can get along. Forgive Aaron and I. How you going to lead? Help. <laughs> and that's just my point. You'll be so weakened. Now I've got to help you. Jesus. <laughs> How are you going to lead the people if the people are leading you. Come on up in here. See, some churches, I'm not like a bully and all that type of stuff, but I'm here to tell you. I do things in a calm way, but I'm here to tell you. Shekinah Worship Center has one pastor, and her name is Dr. Maria Seaman. And God shows me things for Shekinah Worship Center. And I'm also glad he shares other people things too. But the buck stops at the pastor. Now, if a board of trustees, governing body, eldership, whatever, oh, you must want to be the pastor because I'm going to pastor another church. But I'm not going to have a congregation making me weep and cry because you're weeping and crying. Somebody's got to lead. <laughs> That's why Moses and Aaron couldn't be leaders. Because they did not get it. That when a people cannot see God and cannot see what God says, you are not to waste your time trying to beg them to stay with you. Let them go. And if they want to go, let them go. If they want to return to Egypt, let them go. Go back, go back. On the other hand, I have to tell you about three who will see <laughs> these guys here crying. Sorry they hurt everybody's feelings. <sighs> Got to go around apologizing every time because they hurt people's feelings. Nobody knows their heart, you see, because if you know Moses' heart, you know I'm talking about Maria, I'm getting you to two ways. You do know that, right? Of course you know that, right? Nobody knows Moses' heart that Moses is not going to do purposefully anything to hurt anyone. But no people don't know that. So Moses got to say, I'm sorry. I apologize. I did it. I'm like, okay. On the other hand, I'll tell you about who will see. Number three, who will see. Six. And Joshua, <laughs> the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephune, which were of them <laughs> that searched the land, rent their clothes. They come back, heard he crying and weeping. Oh, and, and by that time, the congregation weren't crying and weeping. Moses, what in the world? 
who will see? Joshua and Caleb will see what God says. They don't waste their time talking to fools who are ready to go back to Egypt. Pastor, go talk to them. Oh. <laughs> That's why I feel like doing it. <laughs> I'm already trying for two years. What more you want me to do? They don't want me. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb go into the promised land and check out what God says belongs to them. So while the congregation are complaining, are murmuring, Joshua and Caleb going into Canaan. You didn't hear them talking about giants. All they know is that God said, Canaan belongs to you. The congregation is focused on a giant that they didn't even see. Or the giants didn't see them as grasshoppers. They saw themselves. The people then want to stand Moses. Now, they already are murmuring, already to elect a new leader. And so basically they say, well, we're going to get rid of him. We're going to kill him. We're going to stand him. Yeah, we're going to stand him. Yeah, take him out. Take him out. You missed him with that one? Got him with another one. Take out Aaron. Take, take them both out. Target practice. Take them out. Take them out. Take them out. That, that's just Would you like for somebody else to keep on throwing stones at you? Huh? Just keep on aiming, keep on aiming, keep on aiming, keep on aiming, keep on. It's tiring. It's tiring as a leader if people just keep throwing stones because eventually you're going to say, okay, fine. Take the whole thing, shabang, going. Take, take the whole shooting match. And that's what Moses did. That's why Moses missed out on the promised land. They wanted to stun their leader. Talking about God's people. Because they did not have the heart of Moses. Anybody with a heart to have the heart of their leader does what the leader? Follow the leader. Follow the leader. The Bible didn't say that Moses stirred himself. So what you doing stirring Moses? Mm -hmm, pretty interesting, isn't it? 7 through 10. Watch this. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through, this is Joshua and Caleb, to search it is an exceeding good land. You see that they said anything about giants? Then they say, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land, my God, your confidence, and give it to us. You all missed it. We're not even going to go in and fight for it. God, glory to God. I caught that Holy Ghost. I caught that myself. We won't even have to fight for the land. He's going to give it. He's going to give it to us. Talk about no giants. He said, and a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Come on, folks, don't, 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 don't come against God. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are, oh, stop. <laughs> they are bread for us. They, just, they were giants. They said they were bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And so Joshua and Caleb are saying that anybody in the land, that God will use them to supply for us what we need every day. So even if the sons of giants are in the land, God is using them to do landscape on my land. God is using them in order to keep the vegetation in order to work the field because God said that he's given me the land and that whoever's in my land you better work my land you better do what you've been called to do because my name's on the deed my name is on the property God said it belongs to me 
No giants. Bread. What? He said, their defense is departed from them. Oh, yo. In other words, what they could fight with before, what they could do before, it's departed. Catch it. This can be sweet. This can be sweet for somebody this week. God will disarm your enemy. What they think they have to use against you, God said it has departed from them. Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. All, the, all that good news, all that good news. Look at the next verse. Church people are something by it. <laughs> Check the next. But all the, in other words, whatever. All that good stuff. They just said, whatever, anchor, whatever. But all the congregation beg, stand them with stands. After, he, after, after Moses, Joshua, everybody's bringing them good news. They said, stand them. Some people, you can't even bring good news. Like casting your pearls before swine. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. Let me say this. In the midst of hatred, God still shows up. In the midst of everyone wanting to stern him, dethrone him, that's Moses, God shows up in his glory. I take refuge in that. That as long as I'm speaking what God says, it doesn't matter what's being said that's negative. Because God will show up in his glory. Moses says, Moses is a nice guy, bless his heart. Moses says, if you read the scripture, he says, God, please don't strike them down with disease because then the Egyptians, they're going to read the, I mean, read the local newspaper. God, I know these people are, I know they're hard-headed and I know that they want to kill me, they want to vote me out, I know all that. You know, watch now. Because I'm saying they want to vote out God's representative. Don't miss it. Just look at the layers of what I'm saying. Uh, you know, but, but if, if the Egyptians heard it, you know, if they read in, in the Egyptian Gazette that people turn on leader. Mm -hmm. Heard that, Father Russell? You, you know our papers, newspapers, that is. Mass mayhem breaks out just before Canaan. They call God a fool. And then all oh, how breaks out. Moses says, God don't, because God's like, I'm taking them out. God said, I'm killing them. I'm look, I have fear of God. You. When they come against Moses, Kathy, go read it. It's interesting. God says, I'm taking them out now. Moses, after being talked about, Moses nice. Moses is nice. Moses still goes, watch it. And that's the word. Intercedes, God, don't take them out. Don't take them out now. Grant them some mercy and grace. Because God, watch the rationale. God, if the Egyptians hear that you have given them diseases, then what they'll do is rebuild their army and start to march after your people. And God, then the records will show that we never made it into Canaan. God, we would look real stupid. Uh, God, then your name would not be honored. My, he must go and say, Lord, just buy something. Ain't it something that first Moses couldn't talk? That he had a stammering tongue? Now he's standing up like a lawyer. Well, God. People like when I say that when I'm over, God. 
well, God, if you do this, God says, all right, I, Moses, all right, I won't kill him. But I'm going to tell you this, Moses, I am not going to let this crew here enter into the promised land. Oh, no, they have, they have come against me. They've come against my leaders, and therefore, okay, let them live. But guess what? Where we're, they'll never live in Canaan. What? <laughs> they'll never live in Canaan. God is wow. God gives them a break because of Moses. So the people will not be killed today, but they'll die in the wilderness. All that God had showed them, they refused to obey and worship God fully. These people would not make it in. They had seen God's glory, hear me? They had seen God's glory and refused the glory of God. 23 to 24. Because all those men which had seen my glory, no excuse, and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened unto my voice. Hmm. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Uh, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, <laughs> and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. And so Caleb is God's servant and not man's servant. And that's what we are going to have to choose in the 21st century. Are we going to serve man or God? And if you are of a spirit like Caleb and Joshua, then you will decide to be God's servant. And only God's servant will experience the glory. And the glory is in Canaan land. And if you are going to experience the glory, that means you're going to bring your seed with you. That's why he killed the, pre the present generation, died in the wilderness. But those who were 40 and younger, they got to live because they were of another mindset. They were not of the mindset of the world. They were not, remember, these are Israelite Egyptians or Egyptian Israelites. They were not, see, if you're, if you're 40 and below, well, by this time they have been in the wilderness. So actually, if you, ooh, thank you, Jesus. I'll pause it, they're seeming and explaining it for clarity. <laughs> God said, I will spare those who are 40 and below. How many years were they in the wilderness? Forty. So in other words, I will spare those who never were in Egypt in the first place. Except for Joshua and Caleb. And so these were born of another spirit. They had, it's different. If you come into the church from another church, you come into this church, it's different if you come into this church as a sinner who's never been in church. I'll leave that there for thought. <laughs> Only those who dare see it, director, as Caleb saw it, as Joshua saw it. I don't know about you, but that's where I cry out things like this, Lord, make me over. Oh, I've had some, I've had some terrific experiences. Even, even this morning, Mother De Silva will tell you. I said, well, this morning's blessings they can't do for tonight. It's over. This morning's done. God, you've got to do it again. And that's the way that we have to face every wilderness as we are preparing to go into the new Canaan. The blessings of yesterday, the manna of yesterday. I need fresh manna. I need a fresh supply so that my eyes won't see like the enemy sees. But I have fresh eyes, excitement in my eyes, expectation in my eyes. Why? Because God has caught my eye. Who is catching your eye? Everyone standing to your feet. And so Jude 
He, he doesn't want you to miss it. That Listen, you cannot operate in flesh and expect to be in good standing with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Therefore, Jude speaks to warn the church. Don't miss it, church. That Jude is speaking to the church and encouraging them, encouraging the church not to miss it. Sounds kind of weird, isn't it? Strange that I have to preach to the church not to miss it. Sometimes we think that we are saved, got our name on the church road, and that spiritually, well, we can just chill now. But I'm here to tell you that when you enter into the church, you will need to be encouraged because you are going to need some courage. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. If you think that the devil was after you before you got into the church, well, not really because he already had you. It is when you step into the church that he heats up the fire seven times hotter. It's when you get into the church that things begin to rattle your mind and that never bothered your mind before. It's when you get into the church that the enemy has to set up traps and tricks and downfalls and demonic uh, influences in order to devastate the church. He ain't got for the sinner. He got them packed up in a luggage and on the way to hell. But the church, we've got to understand it more clearly than anything that the devil is on our track trying hard to turn us back. He ain't waving hands. He ain't high-fiving you. He ain't singing, ole, ole. No, no. He's singing, I want you out of the church. I want you on your way to hell. And this is why Jude speaks to the church. A warning. You are sanctified for a reason. <laughs> so you can be, here it is, preserved. Pre-served. Pre meaning before. You are before served. That, that before you go out and serve the world, the gospel message that you've got to be pre-served. You've got to be kept yourself. You've got to be in place yourself. You've got to be secure yourself so that when you get out there, the world won't slap you upside your head and send you back running like a dog with its tail between his legs. You've got to be preserved, sanctified, and meet ready for the master's use. God desires that his people be preserved. You see, if you are not preserved, you cannot serve others. Hmm. Church, my family, my extended family, they, they honor me like I am, I am the beat preparer. Nobody, apparently, can pickle beats like the pastor. <laughs> Let me put it another way. Nobody can preserve the beats like the pastor. So I was thinking to God, Holy Spirit. He said, all right, see, Mick, do you see it? I said, I see it. He says, listen, sometimes when you go into the grocery store and you pick up the bunch of beets, they're all dirty. Anybody ever picked them up? And before you know, the cashier's got to wipe down the, <laughs> wipe down the roll of the, because <laughs> it's so dirty. God said, that's the way you come into the kingdom, that you've been picked and you're dirty. But what you've got to do, he says, you know what you do? You get clean by the washing of the water. <laughs> you see, if, if you yield yourself to the spirit of the living God, oh, that was dirty. Oh, that was in the way. Oh, that was tarnishing your image. God will wash it away. And then, and then, let me, can I tell you how I did it beats? Oh, it's not, it's not like a short microwave process, you know. Feel that there, feel that there, Molly. Hard, isn't it? Beats are hard. Hard. You, you want to bite into this? Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, this, this, this bunch of beets is not ready to be served because they haven't been pre-served. So what's the process? All right, all right, I'll tell you how I do it. I know you're going to try it this week coming up. Watch. So, 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 now here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
whenever I'm going to begin the process, I make sure, oh God, I love you, Holy Spirit, that I am going to be at home for a season of time. Yes. <laughs> Can I tell you that unless you keep your frame in church, unless you keep yourself still in church, that, that you can't even go through the process of becoming preserved so that you can serve somebody. So it goes like this. I get a big old pot. Oh, first of all, somebody say first of all. Right, because first I gotta get a knife and I cut off all the excess. You gotta cut it up. If you're gonna be served, to anybody, you got to cut off the excess baggage. Yes. Then I take what's left. See, some of you don't understand that after God takes off the excess baggage, there will be what's left, what he wants to preserve. Yes. Lord, have mercy. I'm having fun with this already. So, so then tops are cut off. Take the bottom. Let me tell you. Then you got to put it in a pot. Fill your pot with water. Then boil that bad boy. You got to boil it sometimes for three hours. I think that's why they like me doing it. Because they know I'm going to be home on the computer for three hours at least. And so I put it on high. Get that thing boiling. And when I can, watch this. Oh, oh, God, yeah. God's amazing. He's blessing me up here. When you can... Take a knife and stick it in the center, and the knife goes straight through. You say it's soft enough to be used. Can I help somebody that when the sword of the word can cut you, that's when you know it can heal you. But unless it cuts you, you never know it can heal you. Unless you yield yourself. To the living word, you won't be able to be, be preserved so that you can serve. Let the word cut you. So, back to my beats. No, 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 no. Once, once it's that hot, cooked through, soft, what you have to do is let it cool down. Cool down. Got to let it cool down. Sometimes you can't touch hot situations. Just let it cool down. All right? Just let them cool down. Why, why you want to cool down, Pastor? Because I want to be able to handle the beats. I, I want to be able to handle the beats. <laughs> because what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the skin. Oh, Lord Jesus. I I'm going to take off the dermis. Take off the epidermis. <laughs> take off that which covers. I hear you again, Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit is saying that's what I want to do with my people. Some of them wear masks. But I want to have it that they can have the cover removed. That the mask can be taken off. Because the process of being preserved has to take place. So, so then, okay, so then, so then once, once the skin's off, put the skin in the trash. About my knife, right? Okay, then I take another bowl. Oh, that was the cleaning one. Right, right. So I take a bowl, right? Put water in, fresh water. It can't be the water I use to clean. When God, when God delivers you from something, don't go back and try to get clean. You need a fresh touch, a fresh move, a fresh anointing. Lord Jesus. This is all about beats, y'all. I know why you're getting so happy talking about beats. So you put the water in, right? Now, now here's the thing. And actually, you should do this first. Put vinegar in. Oh, Lord Jesus, not, not the vinegar. Anybody drink straight vinegar? Oh, no, no, no. Why not this stuff? Acidic. This stuff, powerful. Oh, Lord. For a copy of this sermon in CD or DVD format, in its entirety, please visit our website at 
swim-international.com or email us at swim at logic.vm. We look forward to hearing from you. Glory to glory. Glory to glory.